<laughs> so we start like, I start like trying to have a Charleston contest. Oh my gosh. So the girls will leave so that I can get back to writing Hostel and listening to Quentin Read Me and Glorious Bastards. Oh my gosh. Oh, oh honey. honey. Welcome to the Oh Honey podcast. Where you get the sticky and the sweet with Summer. And Amanda. And Eli Roth. Woohoo! <laughs> Hello. So today is Halloween. Oh my God, I'm so excited. You <laughs> this is like purposely <laughs> planned this <laughs> with you. <laughs> it, if you guys... It's amazing that it worked out that I just came over and it's right on Halloween. Yeah, like, it's I just incredible. Even... It's Halloween week. It was so weird. I was walking down the street in my pajamas and I'm like, oh my God. You're like, what are Amanda and Summer doing? Yeah, so, well, yeah. I, I'm a little disappointed, not going to lie. You uh, know, everyone expects me to be in horror, like, Halloween-y pajamas. Right, as But you sometimes, should. you know, I'm just, like, wearing blue and looking all colorful. I mean, it's contradicting a little bit because you write a lot of horror scripts, like Cabin Fever, Hostel, direct a lot of horror movies. and But now you do a bunch of other things, too. You have I house, do. House with the Clocks. I did, like, kids horror, spooky horror. I like to yeah. play against type. Yeah. I think everyone thought initially that I was going to look like, you know, when they, they saw Marilyn my Manson. movies, they thought I would look like Marilyn Manson or <laughs> yeah. Rob Zombie. And then it's like the nice Jewish boy. Yeah. And it's just, it's I like never it. know. You're into you, it. Yeah, I'm into look, it. Look, you can't yeah. change who you are. I mean, I, I've tried temporary tattoos. And, you could, <laughs> and I've tried you, that look and it doesn't. Really? Yeah, really I mean, is. just, and I got, well, I got a henna tattoo once. I don't know if that counts. Yeah. Um, <laughs> And then I sort of like when I get sweaty, I look like I'm wearing eyeliner anyways. Oh, that's true. You, you my, have like the nice eyelashes. Thank you. With the long eyelashes, I get like, I look like I have guy liner on. So that's about as goth as it gets for me. Yeah, guy liner. Guy liner. I like that. I like that. I never heard guy that liner. before. Really? He is a writer. <gasps> that's right. The word <laughs> wizardry comes out. Um, but no, but I think that uh, a lot of times people do that and I think it's an affectation. Mm. And I always just, I don't know, I try to be myself. Yeah. Love it. Really? Well, really? you're also working on a shark documentary. A documentary, yeah, about shark finning. Yeah. Because sharks are like the most misunderstood monsters. It's so Because they're not monsters. They're like our friends and they're really sweet. And I always, look, I like to show the worst in people. Mm -hmm. And I think of it as like a real life horror movie. Yeah. Because what we're doing to sharks is so shockingly, it's this insane, in, decimation of an entire species mm -hmm. for something that's completely unnecessary, which is soup that's totally tasteless, yeah. these health products that actually are terrible for you and cause inflammation, and it's sold in supermarket with meat that's poisonous. It's really, really sad. And there's, yeah, 11,000 sharks an hour are killed. Oh, my God. Well, yeah, I didn't horrible. even know that. That's crazy. Nobody knows. It's 100 million a year. I didn't know that. They think they're going to be gone within, like, I mean, or completely no, within 10 to 15 years. Like dinosaurs just... They extinct. are, I know, and I've seen, yeah. what they, but they're the last, they're older than dinosaurs. Sharks go back 400 million years, wow. so, and their function on Earth is to keep the ocean clean. Yeah. But they've been so demonized in movies. Oh, and Jaws. in pop culture. Yeah, exactly, no, that no, everyone's no, no, like, no. and it's not the fault of Jaws. It's yeah. really, it's people at weddings that want to look, you know, do it as a status symbol. But the problem mm. is that everyone just assumes, oh, sharks are evil, mm. and they're actually quite shy and very intelligent, and they're like dogs and dolphins, and they have personalities and mm -hmm. families, and they're They are smart. just like dogs. I went swimming with the, well, they were nerf sharks, but. They are. <laughs> yeah, but they acted just like what dogs. What? Nerf sharks. I thought the she nerf said shark. nerd sharks. I was like, you. They're nerd sharks. <laughs> yeah, they're I'm a shark scary, nerd, but, but <laughs> those are, yeah, the nerf sharks in the Bahamas yeah. by the pig island. Yeah, you just have to like, Close your hands because you have bait, basically, yeah. smell But on your they're fingers. like dogs. They'll come up yeah. to you. They just want the fish. Yeah. They don't want to bite you. And yeah. they're just like when you have a ball and the dog wants to play with it and they come up. It's so I've, true. I've hand fed reef sharks before and they're the same way. Yeah. They don't charge at you. They're not attacking you. They're, they're just carefully. And same thing with tiger sharks. Yeah. Like they'll come in. I mean, I'm not like saying that all sharks are friendly and <laughs> so sweet. So go hang out yeah. with a great white. Um, You'll be fine. <laughs> but, they, uh, but they're way more intelligent than people realize. And right. you yeah. know, they're very sensitive, very shy creatures. So, and we're just demolishing them. So I'm making a documentary about it. Yeah, wow, we need them so for crazy. an ecosystem. Yep. So that's awesome. There's a lot yeah. of misunderstood animals. You know how it's like, well, d dogs are like the animal that everyone loves, but then it's like pigs are so, ew, it's a pig, it's a, and they're yeah. so frowned upon. Pigs are like smarter than dogs. They're smarter like, than so, a three-year-old. They're so smart. I had a pig. And they're not Did dirty. Did you? 
I had a pet pig. What type I love of pigs. Is it a big one? Well, it, it started as a micro pig, but and it turns out a micro... They always sell them like that, and then they grow and grow and grow, and people are like, okay, uh, this isn't a little pig anymore. <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, a micro pig, I found out, is like a micro person. Yeah. In that it's like a baby. Yeah. If you feed it, it grows. And of Very course, large. the woman who sold it to me was like, well, I sold Paris Hilton her pig. Uh -huh. And I figured, well, Paris knows what she's doing. She's smart. She's pets. She's... And then I finally met Paris after. I'm like, did you get scammed by the pig lady? She's like, I totally got scammed. I'm like, really? where's your pig? She's like, it's 600 pounds, lives on a farm. The pig, once the pig, Pennington, the thing with the, the I pigs, love the name. Pennington, the pigs are smarter than dogs to the point where you cannot train them because they know that the only reason to do something is for food. Ah, so they'll they be like, come here, you. come here. They outsmart you. <laughs> yeah. So I would sit there and clean up. I had a little, little, like a litter bowl for Pennington. And he hmm. would just come up and he would just flip the whole thing over. And I would have to clean it up and, he and like sweep the whole thing. And then I'd walk away and then he'd want to play. And then if I, if I was leaving, he'd walk over and he'd flip the litter bowl. He'd be like messing with you. And then sometimes I'd be on my iPad and he'd come and knock it out of my hand and he would just be like, rrr, rrr, He's rrr, a bully. Rrr. They're so he was. Cute. It was. I was basically, you become a pig's assistant. Yeah. I was sitting there on the couch and Pennington would knock the iPad because her noses are very strong. Yeah. And then he just wanted to like snuffle in he my chest and like, pet him for like an hour. Then you put him down, not enough. And he would just look at me and just piss right on the couch. Doing it. And I go, Pennington. And then he would run back to his bowl and finish like in the litter tray. <laughs> like he totally knew. Once he started eating the Steinway, I was like, do not bite the piano. He walked and was like, oh. he took a bite out of my piano. And the thing was, he was huge. So I finally found, uh, it's actually a farm that's by a children's school. Okay. So it's like a petting zoo and he has a friend named Duke and I get like updates. Aww. But now he looks like Pumpa from Lion King. Like he's got the tusks. He's really? They grow pounds. for years. People think, oh, it's a baby. They sold you a grow. boar. They grow for years. They sold me a wild boar. Like, a, like <laughs> yeah, a proper, a like the thing, he could have eaten me one day. Like yeah. I would have waken up, you know. Those things are dangerous sometimes. Yeah. Very <laughs> affectionate. Yeah. That's very amazing. smart. Very funny. But he had a squeal that was so loud yeah, that, too. that like the neighbors were like, what is he like? Like, of course I'm the guy who moves in the neighborhood and it's like, oh, he makes hostile and hostile too and he chops yeah. people up. And then there's this pig squeal, which is not like a your, recognizable thing. You're not like, oh, pigs. that's the pig. It's this, Ree! it's this horrible. Coming from your home. Coming from my house when he didn't want to go out or you have to give him a bath. You have to put moisturizer on him. I put him in the bath. Really? I oh, you gotta moisturize that. your pig. I'm like, guys, what? I can't. Yeah, you got the pig, their skin gets very dry. Oh. So you have to, you get like special shampoo and then moisturizer. And then they're like scrambling. And I'm right. like, I mean, this was every day. The amount of maintenance it took to take care of the pig. That's a lot. It really outweighed the novelty of Did having you have a, a your wife <laughs> like, or girlfriend at that time? Well, my girlfriend oh, at the time is the one who convinced me to do it. She oh. was like, and she's showing me all these videos. Of course, she went on a deep dive of, teacup micro pigs yeah. and she's like and of course like what, thing that's in. what guy would get a pig unless his girlfriend was like oh get the pig get the pig yeah. so of course we were going to name him piggy smalls notorious pig uh, we had like so good little you that know we nice. had sweaters that were made for him and i ordered him and he can't he comes to the house i can't it's weird i really i couldn't eat meat for a while i eat yeah. meat now but i can't eat bacon like after that i can't eat bacon or pork because it's like eating your friend and of course she was like oh i'll take him on weekends but Never once happened. Yeah. And so then we why, broke up and I was like left with a pig. Um, Penny, Pennington? Pennington just sounded like a very royal, regal, like I wanted some like very pretentious, pompous name yeah. for pig. I didn't want like it's Ralph comedic. the pig. I wanted like, like, little, I wanted, like little, I wanted trumpeteers. <laughs> we thought about Piggy Smalls, but it seemed a little too obvious. Then Pennington was a little more. <laughs> yeah, it's a little corny, so. You would be, yeah. uh, have you done uh, like a c comedy? Have I done comedy? Yeah, yeah that's what no, I would I, think I, that he would do. Like when he got here, he's he funny. <laughs> oh, that's never a good. <laughs> what? <laughs> no, but she, that's she what, saw you. She's like, yeah, comedy. No, 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 no. Thank when you. He gets here, he's <laughs> like, yeah, he's like, boy, you, know, you have a face for radio. You know, when he gets here, and he's making all those jokes about oh, like, what yeah, he doesn't yeah, want to yeah. talk about. You're funny. I try. Yes, at times I've been known to be funny. I want to make a comedy. Yeah, I, mean, I, I think, think you I've should. Done, I, I would I like think you to do it all. If you do a comedy. I mean, if, I need, if only I could find some funny girls. Let me know. <laughs> um, no, I want. I was going to do comedies. I've had comedy scripts, but mm -hmm. the stuff that I like is kind of edgy and somewhat offensive. I that's think my that's, humor, that's my so. favorite comedy is where mm -hmm. people go. You're oh. not like like you don't know if the whole room's going like to laugh, laugh or it's going to be like get, like that's that's like offended or like. Yeah, funny. I thought I just think it's yeah. hilarious. And honestly, when I'm killing someone in a horror movie a lot of the times I find it absolutely hilarious. Yeah. Like when an audience is reacting and people are screaming and like in Green Inferno, I, I was my friend Aaron and we're like, what's like the most horrible 
You know, you just like sit around and you're like, what's the worst thing that can happen? What's the worst thing you can do? And then I just yeah. film it. And then when we're like cutting out his tongue and screeching out his eyes and chopping his arms off, we're like, I love we're how like he's laughing. Yeah. They're like gleefully, gleefully laughing. It's yeah. the funniest thing. And then when audiences scream, I saw a running vomit from Hostel. I saw people crying and we were just like, I was in tears. I thought it was the funniest. I'm like the kid you love that played the reactions. It. I love it. I love it. I'm like the kid that played a prank on the whole class. Uh, we did something really gross, and someone screamed, and it caused total chaos. And the so teacher funny. got mad. That's like my. That's why the movies are so favorite. good, though. It's because your satisfaction is from people's reactions to your movies. I love it. So I was never. I mean, for me, I was never like when I went. Oh, I want to be a director. I want to get an Oscar. To me, the Oscar movies when I was a kid. I'm not saying this is always the case. As a kid, I was like, why isn't the thing winning Best Picture? Why isn't Evil Dead Best Picture? Mm -hmm. This doesn't make sense to me. Like, who wants to see Gandhi? What about Ghostbusters? Like, that should be the best picture. So I always wanted to make movies that would just get, like, an insane, insane reaction. Mm -hmm. At my bar mitzvah, I wasn't friends with any girls. This is, like, there's more girls right now than at were my at my bar, bar mitzvah. mitzvah. <laughs> yeah. At my bar mitzvah? I wasn't friends with, and everyone was having these dances. And they would get, like, a DJ. And, I mean, this was, you know, this was the 80s bar mitzvah, mm -hmm. Newton, Massachusetts, like heavily Jewish. Everyone was trying to outdo each other with like winning yeah. the limbo contest. And then they get like the Boston Breakers. They were actual, <laughs> like these Jewish kids sit around and like watch these like kids from Boston and come in. Like, <laughs> just, that's so funny. And then try to do it. It's yeah. like, thank God there weren't cell phones around. Um, but right. I was in friends and my parents were like, do you want to have a dance? And I was like, what, like a bunch yeah. of guys? Like girls thought I was weird because I was like a little, Pudge ball and an Iron Maiden in Texas Chainsaw Massacre t-shirt. And I, we, I got cut in half with a chainsaw at my bar mitzvah. I was like, I will do my bar mitzvah if I get cut in half with a chainsaw. And I found out that the magician learned the trick. My mom called every magician in Boston. They found someone and they found a guy that would cut me in half with a chainsaw. Really? And he's like, this thing's real, don't move. I'm like, so of course I was like screaming. Oh my. And I'm like, it was my, real? It was like, a real chainsaw. I was like, a real, it was a circular saw that cut you me. You didn't take the chain off? No, he used the circular saw, like the oh, kind oh, oh, And I was you. really mad that it wasn't a chainsaw. I was like, yeah. I was like, like well, that's not what I wanted. the trick only works with a circular saw. So he did a circular saw. The guy really did it. And like, he could have killed me. I yeah. actually could have been killed. I think about it now, but, and then we watched, <laughs> it was hilarious at the time. And then we watched the horror movie Mother's Day. Oh, and yeah. It was, and it was like an ax in the balls and heads being chopped off. And kids the were gore. just... The go I was just, I've never been happier. People yeah. were like, that I've never was, been happier. I was like eating pizza, watching decapitation, being like, I'm a man now. This is yeah. amazing. <laughs> this is great. This is what it's going to be like. But, you know, it's weird how you like, you have your mind set on one thing of, oh, I'm going to do this. Yeah. And then you actually do it. And it's, it's amazing. It feels great. Yeah. You're like gleeful about it. Making your dreams come Dream true. And nightmares. And then when you pass and it on. <laughs> But yeah. now that's why, was, yeah. but it was, that's why it was fun doing the kids movie with House of the Clock in its Walls because yeah. I wanted to, everyone's like, when are you going to, everything I'd done was super R-rated. Mm -hmm. So they'd say, well, when are you going to do a movie that like my, I can take my kids so to? So cool. So I, I wanted to do a gateway drug movie. Yeah. You gotta, like, hook it them. is. Yeah. You know, like Gremlins, Beetlejuice. Those are like, <laughs> get them yeah, early. Those are, get them early. Those, yeah. are, those are really great gateway drug movies because you see it and it's scary and it's <laughs> like doing all these like, you know, forbidden things. And yeah. It's a little bit dangerous, but it's still safe enough. Mm -hmm. So I want to know the reactions of everybody at your bar mitzvah, though. Oh my God, I had a cousin who, like, kids had nightmares. Like, like these these <laughs> were kids who were not every other allowed to watch <laughs> Jewish scary movies. boy in town. <laughs> oh my God, people were like, these should have been T-shirts. I survived Eli Roth's bar yeah. mitzvah. I had like, I mean, like, my grandparents were legitimately in shock yeah. watching me get cut with a with a circular right. saw like everyone else that was is like, real is like going to bar mitzvahs and they're like doing candle lighting ceremonies and giving yeah. these emotional speeches yeah. and my cake was, was like a, death my cake was a director's <laughs> like, slate me. with blood it was a director's slate to take 13 with blood splattered on the slate That's so what so did your parents think of you were they like they're like something's wrong with this kid <laughs> <laughs> yeah. like, something's wrong with this child here's the good thing my dad was a, a psychoanalyst he's retired now but he was a psychoanalyst and oh. professor at harvard in the medical school so, and my mom's a painter. So they were they like, it. oh, this is totally healthy. My yeah. dad's like, oh, this is, this is, Eli's always the best behaved. I was never in trouble. I was never in a fight. They thought something was wrong with me because I never got in trouble because I was so well behaved all the time. I was the kid that if the teacher left the classroom, they could leave me in charge. I was a neighborhood babysitter. I was a camp counselor. And my dad thought this was how I like, oh, this is how he gets out his mischief. Yeah, right. it's your outlet. This is how it, yeah. And your yeah. mom being a 
artist. She already she's is like, the, oh, like, express yourself. Exactly. Yeah, she's like, express it's yourself. wonderful. She's like, we, my brothers and I, we all had our easels. We had our art station. It was like, from the time we were kids, like, our, I was very lucky. My parents were New Yorkers and we grew up in Boston where it was really like, what's wrong with you if you're into anything creative? You should yeah. have been a doctor, a lawyer, a banker. Like, you're going to be basically be starving and homeless if you want to be an artist. And I was mm -hmm. like, you're all lovely people. I'll be in Hollywood making <laughs> movies. Yeah. I really was like, I was mistakenly put here. I was supposed to be born in Hollywood directing movies. Like, yeah. I don't know what to tell you. Yeah. You're, so I sort of never took anything that seriously because I was like, I felt like an outsider. I felt like an alien. Yeah. Observing. And I grew up in Boston in the 80s when it was just like... I mean, it's, it's so interesting to see where the world is now with bullying and sensitivity. I had teachers that would be like, shut up, you faggot! Like, that right? was not... Yeah. Oh, my God. Change, so there yeah. was Mr. Cook, our metal teacher. He's like... Mr. His Cook? Catch, Mr. Cook. His catchphrase was, you stupid fag. Oh, my God. I mean, he's dead now, so we, I can't, like, yeah. bring him back and make him a social media star, which yeah, is yeah. all I want to do. Because he's <laughs> like... That's all I want to do. I remember, like, Mr. Cook... I'd be like... He would teach metal shop, and kids would be like, Mr. Cook, I can't do this. He's like, yeah, well, you're a stupid fag. He's like, if you weren't such a queer about it, you'd know how to do it. And we were like, that was that was normal. <gasps> yeah. That was like the way Especially kids talk. Especially for the older generation too, like you know the teachers then the yeah, like their teachers yeah yeah zero filters Nothing. whatsoever. It's like they didn't even have a sense. It was like a lot of ignorance too of just like not knowing. Yep. <laughs> you know, but of course. Of course, yeah, you it's look totally back now different and you can now. See where it came from, but oh yeah, yeah. oh yeah. Can you, can you imagine <laughs> someone saying that? They'd be on like front cover of every news channel like yeah. being sent to jail <laughs> i know no we grew up with like it was it was hardcore bullying yeah everyone just sort of i, I mean you could either like get crushed Sucked by it, it or you just it, it was a chris rock who said bullying is the fertilizer that makes you grow <laughs> and i was like that's it like you're just motivation you're like okay you can all pick on me you can all do this but yeah. one day i'll be but nowadays a war we hero have in little movie. keyboard warriors that are bullying and yes they say yeah. a lot more hurtful things than you know, like when people say stuff to you, person, like your face, like eh, it's not. Now they say the most evil stuff on their fake profile. Yeah, and stuff. No, they can get away with more because it's not so direct. It's, yeah, yeah. They can I hide. was I was in the first wave of cyber sex when I was in college, and I was cyber yeah, sex. Cyber sex, it was called what back then. That? What is that? I love that. <laughs> there was, is it the shuffle one? It's what so funny. That? Cyber sex was a term. That was created when the internet and modems started showing up. Yeah. When I was in college, I went into my, my RA. It was like, you the RA's in charge of the floor, my friend Bob. And he, he had this thing. I was like, what is this? He's like, this is the internet. I'm like, what's the internet? He's like, it's like blinking messages. I'm like, and it was, he's being paid by Penthouse Magazine to type like filthy messages and back and forth, what we would call texting or yeah. DMing, or I, it was like it was messaging yeah. back and forth. Doctors and scientists were the only ones on the internet. They were paying fifty cents a minute. We were getting. He was getting yes. paid like twelve dollars an hour. These people were paying like three or four hundred dollars a night to talk to a girl, a penthouse pet that they thought saying like filthy things. Little do they like, know it's like this bull guy like on the back the end. Desk. But that's the thing. I was. I was like, what? what is this? I want in on this. Yeah. And he's like, he's like, well, it's penthouse. And there were ads in the magazine, like talk to our pets. He's like, it's me and three other guys. I was like, I want a job. Oh my he's God. like, well, one guy is thinking about quitting. <laughs> and I was like, so maybe you can take his job. So we went on his computer and we were just like, you suck. None of the guys like you. Your messages are terrible. Who'd want to f you? You're awful. And he's like, we bullied him. Oh and he's my like, God. I'm and quitting. And so I bullied him and he quit and I took his job. And so I got the fourth You terminal. bullied him out of a I job. I bullied him out of a job, a thousand percent. I heard he was yeah. like thinking of quitting and we just, it's like you I just pushed him off the, the ledge. Final little yeah, so, it's like. So I would start at like nine o'clock till three in the morning. I'd be in my dorm room and everyone, I mean, I don't know how explicit we can be in your podcast, but people were, people like, I had like 10 guys around and they'd be like, yeah, tell them to do this, tell them to do like, And then, and I got so fast at typing. Then I was like, they're like, no, 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 no. He doesn't get that yet. He hasn't earned it. He's got to be nicer. And then I would have, He's be nicer. I had to have like six different personalities. Yeah. I was Mireille, the beautiful 22 year old French girl who loved sunbathing topless in Central Park and couldn't oh, understand Mireille, why it was a crime. Yeah. Then I was, <laughs> Tam was oh, then honey. I was Tammy, the like, Tammy was like a hardcore, like heavy metal slut who had like gangbang guns and roses and poison and loved group sex with lots of like heavy metal rockers. Oh, right, right, right. And then there was Allison with a Y and she was recently oh. divorced 
And she would try, she was was a writer and she was trying to meet characters for a new book, but she was really bad at it. Yeah. And, but, but then the guys were like, Allison, we don't want to have sex with you because we respect you too much. And I'd be like, really hurt. Be like, no, please. But I'd do like a really bad job. It's like someone who's never talked dirty before trying it for the first time using Uh. like very technical. And and so I was switching in and out (laughs) and you'd have like 10 guys going at the same time. (laughs) And so you'd were, be like multiple personalities. I was switching and like, personalities. And I swear to God, it helped, it helped me with writing. Yeah, I'm sure. Because you're like thinking of dialogue in character from this other person. So, and I sat down and at some point my parents were like, where did you learn to type like that? Because I was typing like 100 words a minute. <laughs> and I was like talking so fast. They were like, how did, I was like, oh, paid. I don't know. I've just been, I've just been practicing. Oh, my I love gosh. how you remember all this, every single detail. Well, well he really well, built those characters. Here's I mean, the problem I have. I, I have Allison one of, with a Y. You, I'm like, damn, these details. Like, I love it. Who is it, it? On, on Taxi? Who is the actress who was it? Um, who remembers everything that ever happened to her? I don't know. And I, I'm not at that level, but I have a very, very weird memory. And I thought that everybody had this memory, but I can remember things that happened like in fourth grade, like they happened this morning. Really? And my, I found out my brother was like this too. And we would start. We sort of realized, and we just kind of. And my friends were like, no, Eli's the elephant. Like, he doesn't forget anything. Mm-hmm. And I can remember. You don't want to do anything bad to Eli. He no, it's terrible. No, but it's, it's Never weird. forget. He's I don't like, want, I don't want to remember. I couldn't remember math. I couldn't remember his, history or stuff. Just moments. But like, I could remember like who arrived at birthday parties in what order, what gift they gave me, do what they wore. birthday party. Like entire conversations that I had in third grade, like completely useless, superfluous information. Yeah. And I think, and I always say like, do I write? to stop the voices in my head or the voices in my head would cause me to write. Like, I don't yeah. know, but there's a weird thing where like this podcast, I'll watch it, but I will like fully remember photographically, but just very strange. Like I, towels not, on he's our He's always going to remember this for the rest oh, of his Halloween outfit. I'm sorry. Forever, you have to everything you do. No, it's not that I want to. It's like, it's hard <laughs> because I'd it. love to delete parts of it but what yeah what about dreams like so me i will have oh, a i'll them. never remember a dream yeah. if i remember a dream it's very rare mm. well here's how to remember your dreams because my father's specialty was dreams so he's a dream analyst so i grew up with a dream psychoanalyst father and That's crazy. analyzing our dreams was like the family activity like we would Every sit morning. at the dinner table yeah we would sit like at dinner at night or at breakfast <laughs> yeah. in the morning because my dad worked out of our house, like in the TV show Growing Pains, which again was before us. Oh, Growing Act. Pains! So, like, wait, yeah. what was the theme song? I can't remember the theme song. Everywhere I go, is that it? I was. I, it's weird because I never. I was not like a big growing. I, I think that was it. I was I way think, more into Charles in Charge. I, I don't know if it was Growing Pains, but there's this one theme song. I, sorry, that sounds familiar though. Completely Everywhere. side tracking here, and we'll go back to your. But I used to bike around my neighborhood singing that song. And just like, just by with a robe on her head, <laughs> yeah. the towel on her head, yeah, and a silky, I go. And a <laughs> silk, right. a silky back, black robe, a silky weird. black Here we robe. Go. Thinking. <laughs> um, so yeah, we analyze. We ask my dad, like, how do you? There's a technique you can do when you right when you wake up. That kind of first thirty seconds is when you can stop, lie totally still, close your eyes, and you'll bring it up to the surface and remember it. Really? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like if you wake up right away and you start walking around and do other things, it's, it's like it dissolves yeah. like cotton candy. Like it's gone. Or like, you know, smoke. It's just, it's I love other. cotton candy. But I love cotton candy too. So I think <laughs> that every morning. So you, if you, cl- you want to remember your dream and you have a little notebook, I keep a notebook beside my bed. Mm-hmm. So if you, and sometimes it's crazy, like ramblings that don't make any sense. Um, but a lot of times you can just close your eyes and then you, it's just, it's all right there. But if you don't do it in that moment when you wake up, mm-hmm. you won't remember it. And if you start doing it as a regular habit, your body and your brain starts to know to hold on to it. Ah. Um, like but I important. became like a dream interpreter. On the set of Inglorious Bastards, I was the dream interpreter. I, my favorite movie of all time, well, thank by you. the way. The Bear Jew. Bear Jew. <laughs> it was fun. I had the yeah. best time. Yeah. <laughs> it was one of the best times of my life doing that movie. Have you seen Inglorious Bastards? I think I have. It's. It, it, you would remember this scene if you if you seen of him coming out of a cave with a baseball bat. With a baseball bat, yeah. yeah. I'm gonna I'm gonna watch Knock it. him out of the park. <laughs> I can't do the remember. accent, guys. I am like bad with how many movies I've watched. I've growing up, we didn't have any cable. My mom really didn't let us oh, watch yeah, she, movies. She was on a so fire now I'm in a on a ranch in Larkspur. People probably think of like some weird like hillbilly just like in the woods, like. But yeah, my mom like wanted us to like be outside and like. Yeah. Look, I didn't even know celebrities or anything until I was probably like, 
14, 15. Like, I, I, the only way I would, like, see celebrities or, like, I would, like, uh, check out at the grocery store. I'd be like, who is this? We knew, like, Brad Pitt. Uh, like, like, the biggest celebrities I've known. Like, All the false like, Angelina news. Angelina Jolie. Like, <laughs> I've known those yeah. celebrities, but, like, I've had to learn so much. So, it's like, I didn't have a lot of catching up to do, like, TV. Well, how old are you? I'm 22. You're, like, you're old, okay. girl. Yeah, no, no, I'm saying you can, it's, like, now's the time. Now is, you know, you wouldn't, now's the time you can start. With it like Tarantino, and you'd start with the Reservoir Dogs and go through his movies. Yeah, like, just you got plenty of time. Like, to start. I need to learn it all. Guys, yeah, Netflix and HBO and it's everything. And now right I there. love movies. I watch a lot of movies, but a lot of old movies that people talk about, it's not that I am like don't want to watch it or was like, oh, no. Yeah. I want to. I'm I never movie movies. shame. I know some people that movie shame. And Quentin was and big like on this. You. Like when people haven't seen a movie, he's not like, you haven't seen that movie. He's like, he's oh, oh my. He's, he's like, excited for you to see it for the first time. So much better. Right. See, that's like, the kind of movie Like I'm jealous that you've never seen it because you get to experience it for the first time. Right. You get that joy of like, oh, I remember the first time I saw that. Like the surprises, the twists. Right, because you can never Seeing unsee it. it. If you've seen a movie the first time, like there are movies that I would love to watch a million times, but it's like you never get that like first like. Yeah. Like, you so know? you get. So you're gonna. You got a lot. So anyway, so in Glorious Bastards, I we were, I was like the resident dream interpreter. We were shooting in Berlin, mm-hmm. and I would interpret Quentin's dreams, and then really? it would get around the the cast, and then oh, Christoph so cool. Waltz, who plays Londa, who mm-hmm. was amazing in the movie and won the Oscar for the movie. Um, the first night he was like, Quentin was like, uh, Eli Kristoff has, a, has this dream. We, we, before we started shooting, it was like the cast dinner the night before shooting. And he starts telling me this dream. And I was like, wait, wait, wait. Like, I got to call on the expert on this one. So I called my dad from mm-hmm. Berlin. I'm like, dad, this is Kristoff. He plays Londa and he has a dream. And I just see Kristoff is like, hello, Sheldon. Yes. Nice to meet. What? <laughs> Yes, I was, there was a mattress and an elevator. Hang on one second. And he left the dinner and he came back like two hours later and he just was like ashen and he yeah. had like tears in his eyes. And he's like, your father is the most incredible man. I, it completely, I understand it. I see the character. I know how I'm going to play it. Like it, yeah. it unlocked everything. Like there's so much in our dreams that tell us what we're thinking, what we're really feeling, Everything we see that we think we're not picking up, every shape, everything, every interaction, every person, it's all going in there. And your dreams are where it comes out. So once you start discussing and analyzing your dreams, it's really one of the keys to kind of understanding what you're really feeling. So since you're a dream uh, interpreter. Interpreter. Amateur, but yes. Amateur, <laughs> but still more than we are, more than anyone is. So. I have always have this dream, like oh. reoccurring dream. It's the only time I remember a dream. Is like I always have this dream where it's like I'm running, but I can't run. Like I'm not going anywhere. It's we- it's yeah. like the weirdest thing. Like my legs, I can't feel them almost, and I'm trying to run, and I'm like not going anywhere. And I just like rem- I like feel this like like in the- my sleep, I feel like like this feeling that I'm like just like feel like defeated. Like I don't know. It's like the weirdest feeling. And anytime I wake up, I'm like, was that a real dream or was that like was I running somewhere? Because me, I'm a fast runner. I like to run. I used to run track and stuff. So then I'm like, wait, can I not run anymore? <laughs> what does that mean? So I just want to know. Well, it can mean several things, but generally, usually dreams. I mean, there's a lot of visual puns in dreams. Mm-hmm. Um, and everyone's had that dream where you're running, you're not going anywhere and you feel like your legs are in molasses and you just feel yeah, exhausted. Well, I, I feel and it's it the worst because the then you wake up and you feel ripped off of a night of sleep because mm-hmm. you're like exhausted in your uh-huh. dream. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you wake up. Generally that dream happens when you're at a point in your life where you feel stuck mm-hmm. and you want to get to the next level. And there's something in your career or in your life, whether it's in your relationship, maybe you're in a relationship that isn't moving forward. Maybe there's a thing in your career that you want to advance to doing an acting thing or a writing thing and it's just not happening for you yet or you're not moving forward. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's, that's generally what that dream means. means. It's pretty obvious and it's pretty simple. Mm-hmm. But when that dream is occurring, next time you have that dream, try to stop and think about like where you are in your life in terms of relationship, in terms of career, in terms of finance. And is there something that either is holding you back or that you're holding yourself back from? Because right. also, like, when you kill someone in a dream or when mm-hmm. someone dies in a dream, it's generally, there's different, even if when it's other people, it's a side of yourself, usually. It's usually right. someone representing an aspect of your personality. So try to, when, when I have a dream like that, 
I think, am I frustrated because I'm not moving forward? What is keeping me from moving forward? Are you, and you know, we all self-sabotage. You'll stop yourself from doing something because it's easier than, you know, it's easier <laughs> than, than failure if it's someone mm -hmm. else's fault. It's like, right. well, I tried to do that, but it, so it's, it's your subconscious is telling yourself that you're, you're stuck. Right. And do you think that's that, that makes sense? Yeah, I mean, I, I, is when I think back to when I would have those dreams, because I haven't had a, that dream for a good, like, six, seven months. Um, but when I would have it, I think I was at a part of my life where it's like, I'm not happy with, like, where I'm at in my career. Or I know that I'm more than what I put on to be. So it's like, mm -hmm. but I stopped myself from being that. So that's of course. Exactly it's like, since, it you sent me, since you've met me. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I'll take all the credit happening. for everything. <laughs> no. And it, always ha it doesn't mean it, you won't have that again. I mean, right. everyone hits the point where you achieve something and then you're at a plateau and you're like, okay, am I ready? Is this from, am I happy where I'm at or am I... You know, everyone you always needs to be moving forward. It's so hard for me to like hear things with this towel. <laughs> I'll talk really loud. <laughs> <laughs> but it looks it's kind of really weird good. that we all have dreams like that. Like, I thought it's I was alone weird. in this. No, 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 no. It's like the dream of your teeth falling out. Oh, yeah, and the dream off. of, you know, being chased by some of the dream of being naked at school. I mean, it's all dreams about, we all, here's the thing. We all have feelings of vulnerability, being afraid. And a lot of the times in our life, we don't allow ourselves to experience those feelings because like, I can't just sit here and be like, we're all going to get blown up. Like whatever that fear is, <laughs> right. you know, we, we all, <laughs> well, you'd be the worst guy to hang out with. I'm more, well, I mean, <laughs> like, I put oh. it into movies, <laughs> yeah. but I try to channel it into creativity. But you know, we, I was, I used to sit there as a kid. I grew up in the safest neighborhood, literally Newton, Massachusetts was what it's like safest city in the country. I would sit there and be like, someone's, De now someone's definitely coming in with an axe and is going to chop up my parents and cut my head Your off with a chainsaw. Poor friends when you were little. Just They're like, probably like, what is wrong? Like, They're probably terrifying. so going going They have no like idea shaking. that that's even a thing. They're like, what is he talking about? All the time. I would think that. I was just like, I, my brain goes there. But I think that we, we all kind of bury those feelings mm -hmm. every day. You know, whatever. Like, we can't walk around feeling insecure about relationships, whatever. And that's why we have therapy is to talk about it. But that, your, your subconscious, it's there. There's your conscious mind where we're at, and then there's your sub, subconscious. And a lot of the times, you're, you're burying it, you're feeling it, and then when it comes out in your dream, that's when you're, you know, you're you know, completely open, and there's right. no judgments, and there's no filter. So that's when you're letting those feelings out. Right. So fun. I have one. Yes. <clears throat> so I haven't had it. It was like when I was little, I would always have this dream, but I still have no idea what it means. If it means I would have it like every night. So... I would wake up in my dream and I would walk downstairs and I w lived in a two-story house in Connecticut and I would walk downstairs and it would be like super dark and spooky and it was like Christmas Eve and then I would walk into the living room and there'd be a big Christmas tree with all the gifts underneath it and then I'd walk up to the Christmas tree and everything would be like eerie silent walk up to the Christmas tree, and then the scariest face of this old lady would come from underneath the tree, grab my legs, and start pulling me under the Christmas tree. What does that mean? What does that mean? Wow. <laughs> Next thing, yeah. Eli puts us in a movie. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I told wow. you about that. <laughs> so in the dream, you would wake up, go downstairs, and, the, and this would happen not around? N not around the holidays. Mm -mm. But I, Christmas has always been my favorite. Not or anymore, for you, Hanukkah. Kidding. Yes, because he's Jewish. <laughs> yeah. Um, or, yeah, we like Tonica. It wasn't as fun as Christmas, though. It kind of felt ripped off. Um, well. I mean, it could mean a number of things. And I don't want, I'd have to almost know you a little bit better to truly know what was going on yeah. in childhood. But there is, there's an, there's an underlying fear. Of I mean, grandma. The, <laughs> of the grandma, of the old woman, of the yeah. old thing that's going to pull you I mean, it's, it could get very personal, the questions I would have to ask you to fully understand it. Mm. But it would have to be like about an underlying fear and underlying happiness that was there in your childhood. Oh, okay. That there's the surface of happiness, mm -hmm. which are the Christmas presents. Yeah. And the safety of the family. Yeah. And then there's something underneath it that's pulling you that you're either, that's either there or that you're afraid of. I think there's a loss of control Mm -hmm. um, an underlying fear of old age, of getting older, of the this ugly. I'm trying to think of what that ugly witch, that ugly and thing. Pulling me under the tree. Pulling you under the tree. Yeah, she was like, "You can't have Christmas." Something that's you underlying that's going to take away your happiness. I don't yeah. know if it was not divorce was or something. 10. There was like yeah, 
Oh, it could have been. Were you divorced? Yeah, Your my parents, parents were going through a divorce. It's the divorce. Yeah. It's but I always thought it was the divorce was fun. Well, of course, on the conscious level, the divorce yeah. is fun. <laughs> but deep. But on the subconscious level, it's yeah. sort of the unhappiness. It's this evil force that's pulling apart your family. That's true. Maybe that's what it, that, that is. There's a great, like you're, you're getting pulled is. through the gifts Look under the tree into like an, that's that's probably I don't I'd have to know you a little better. Yeah. And talk a little more specifically, but you kind of going into and also it's an empty house. You know, yeah. sort of like the, the fear of the empty house and the house being split mm -hmm. and this evil force that's pulling apart. Yeah. The Christmas is when the family's together yeah. and this old woman, this old evil force that's And maybe that, she under. brought that my, she divorce. pulled my parents apart. That's pulling, that's pulling <laughs> that was the, who did it. <laughs> that's pulling the parents apart. This yeah. older figure that's doing it. But I did through the divorce, I was able to like travel more. My dad moved to Massachusetts mm -hmm. to Munson. Have mm -hmm. you heard of Munson? I haven't, which is weird because I know pretty obscure Massachusetts towns. Do you know where? It's yeah. another town. It's like another like random town. So where? That's what it's yeah. called. Yeah. Do you know where? I'm like, I where? Thought he just said yeah. where. where? Yeah. Oh, but do you know where? It's <laughs> like, do you know where? dude, where's my car? Yeah. <laughs> dude. Where's it near? Is it South Shore? Or is it near Springfield? Or like what part uh, of Massachusetts is it? No idea. I would just go. How far would it take <laughs> you to drive to Boston from your house? Um, from Connecticut or from, from Massachusetts? Oh, we never went to Boston. From really? There. Yeah, we would always just go because it was in the mountain and we just do four wheeling and. Um, oh wow! Okay. Yeah, Probably so we 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 would just stay at the top of the hill and then go home. So my parents divorced and then I would go to Massachusetts because my dad had his new girlfriend there, so he moved there and then we would get to go and go to a new place all the time, which was super fun. And then he moved to New York because he got a new girlfriend, so we'd be in uh, Albany like mm -hmm. back and forth. And then my mom got remarried and we moved down south. I was always, I was the last option. I was the last picked in gym class for girlfriends. I mean, really? girls wanted nothing to do with me. Yeah. I could not get arrested in high school. No. I, could I couldn't. I, re I really couldn't. I couldn't That's, get a date. It's yeah. like, it's, it's funny how it all kind of flipped for me later in life, <laughs> where all the stuff you want to have happen when you're like, 15, 16, 17, 18. Yeah. Girls thought I was weird. They thought I was into horror movies. Wanting to be a movie director was really strange. They're like, good luck with that. Yeah, exactly. I wasn't yeah. like into, I mean, I wasn't terrible at sports, but I was not good at sports. Yeah. So I was like a theater kid. And yeah. I was really into scary movies. I was like a fat little nerd. And then I started <laughs> exercising. I finally lost the weight when I was like 14 or 15 and I grew yeah. a foot. But um, <laughs> that you know, that I'm sure that extra foot and like the confidence with that kind of helped you. It did, but I couldn't, I would go away on vacation to like upstate New York or something. And then on trips, meet a girl or like hook up with girls. I mean, what mm. make out, like whatever it was <laughs> yeah. in, you know, back then. Um, <laughs> but I never had a girlfriend in high school ever. I'd like wow. think back to high school. And then when I was a senior, I went to France mm -hmm. and I was an exchange student. And there the girls thought I was cool because oh, yeah. they didn't know the difference. Because you were foreign. You are like Yeah, I was foreign. So, I, they, so that was fun. <laughs> me, And that's oh, when I, I started boy. like, I was like, oh, Europe is where it's at. These mm -hmm. girls are like women. I couldn't believe it. These girls were 16. They were like 25. They yeah. were like smoking and they had makeup and they had very <laughs> cool clothes and they were French and they were like languages. I, we were riding Vespas. I was like, oh my God. Yeah. And they liked me and my, you know, Hard Rock Cafe t-shirt and all that stuff. <laughs> um, and then when I went to college, when I was at NYU, was where I was in film school, I met a girl who was a dancer and she became, um, that was like, wow, it's like I finally have a girlfriend. Mm -hmm. I wanted to meet a dancer. She was a dancer. I was a film student. And the problem is that I met everyone at college. Like we, like you used to wait online to register for classes. Yeah. And I stood for six hours online and we talked and I like wound up that night we like registered for our classes and I wound up like going back to our dorm room and we didn't leave. So everyone who met us yeah. the first month of college, it was like, oh, Eli and this other girl. So then like for the rest of college that haunted me. Cause like, oh. hey, where's your girlfriend? Like, cause everyone met me yeah. initially. That way, yeah. And then um, I had another girl friend. It's funny cause we still like tease each other on our birthdays cause they were very close. We're like, yeah, we're 25 this year, awesome. <laughs> um, and uh, I had a girlfriend my freshman year it would just sort of alternate. I don't know, like the girls at NYU, we would start going up to Barnard. 
Mm -hmm. Because at Barnard, the girls at NYU, every girl was like going to change their hair and get all pierced and tatted up and changing their sexuality and identity. It was like the girls, the girls at NYU go to NYU to go nuts and yeah. like rebel against their parents. And then you go up to Barnard and they're like reading you their poetry and they play Peter Gabriel. <laughs> yeah. And they took me to, the, to my first Take Back the Night rally. So, and they're like, we're going to take back the night. I was like, yeah. what's take back the night? And it was like, all these women are getting up and taking back the night that they were date raped. Mm -hmm. And you're just like saying, I remember one girl just going, my clitoris is not a doorbell. And we're like, <laughs> no, it is not. Yeah. And no, you just not. like, like you go to take back the night and yeah. then she reads you her poetry and puts on Peter Gabriel. And it was like, they had stuffed animals. It was amazing. That's it so was like, awesome. it was like this cozy, you know, there were like these super smart New York City feminist girls, but they were still girly, whereas the girls at NYU were like... Just going crazy. So, yeah, totally not. <laughs> um, and then I think I started, like, there was a period after school where I was like in my early 20s, like 20 to 25, 26, mm -hmm. where I just went nuts. Like it all kind of clicked. I kind of grew into my looks a little bit and yeah. confidence and just sort of You're like, I'm come. sexy. Yeah. I was <laughs> like, girls like sexy. me. Because you have this kind of inner fat kid syndrome. Yeah. When you're 12 or 13 and you go to get your bar mitzvah suit measured, getting back to bar mitzvah, and they say, <laughs> Mrs. Roth, your son's not a large, he's a husky. And I was like, which is a word for like fat Jew boy. And they had to get like a special suit for me because I was such a little fatty with a, you know, little Junie brow. And I didn't know. I didn't know like what girls liked or didn't like. I was just totally, completely clueless. Um, and it's like I just would go on. I wanted as many crazy experiences as I could possibly find. And then when I was 22, I met this woman who was a writer for different magazines, which at the time were the big ones, which was Mademoiselle, mm -hmm. Elle, Harper's Bazaar, Vogue. And it was her and Candace Bushnell were both like writing sex columns. Oh, okay. And so she, I was like her boyfriend and she was like, come on, we're going to the Vogue party. I'm like, okay, what do I wear? And it was just like, That's so cool. this is Anna Wintour, this is this. And I was sort of thrown into this New York City world. Into of the like, fashion industry Into too. the fashion world, into the writing world. Yeah. And that was fun for a while, and then it got like kind of annoying. So I was like, sort of, what am I doing? Um, and then like, where are the chainsaws? Where are the chains? Yeah. And then I and I wanted to. I had written Cabin Fever, and I was trying to make my movie. Love I like. That. I movie was, and I was way. working on sets. It was. I mean, I wrote Cabin Fever when I was 22 yeah. with my roommate, and we thought we were just going to get cameras and go make it with our friends. Um, and it was really. Uh, it, it, I spent six years raising the money, so that whole time I would work on movie sets. Mm -hmm. So I'd have to be on like five. I remember. You know, five in the morning, and I have to get up and like unload the wardrobe trucks and work till midnight. I mean, mm -hmm. I had to like, I would have to like quiet people down from screaming homeless people in the middle of the night and stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was crazy. It was fun, but I worked on Micho Black. I got fired as a terrible stand in. Really? For Micho Black. Yeah, I got fired. Oh my gosh. Yeah, yeah for fired. being an untalented stand in. What were you doing too much? Because that's really all you. It's hard because it's, it's sort of like being an untalented piece of furniture. Yeah. Basically, my friends were the assistant directors, and they were like, they said, they said, well, you can, okay, Brad Pitt has his own stand-in. Do, do you tell your stand-ins that now? <laughs> All the time. Yeah. About, like, you are one untalented stand-in. <laughs> They're like, thank uh, you. They, I mean, thank, thank you. I basically, like, I was working, I, someone had said, you know, if you work as a PA, you get $100 a day. If you work as a stand-in, you can be in SAG and get 100 or 200 dollars a day but it all goes towards health insurance you make a lot more money mm -hmm. and you don't have to like really do anything yeah. and you can watch the dp light watch like the whole crew kind of working and lighting and yeah, it's like learning almost learning yeah. yeah and so i they said well why don't you stand in for this guy jake weber mm -hmm. and i said okay so i showed up and normally it doesn't really matter like if your height is close enough it's fine and they were like okay jake is like just a little bit taller than you i'm like okay so yes. the first shot was a two shot like this of Jake and Anthony Hopkins walking side uh -huh. by side. So like I get in the frame and they're like, is he tall? The deep is like, they're like, is he taller than you? I'm like a little bit. They're like, okay, you perch up. So I just sort of like go up like on the balls of my feet. And I'm like standing there and like, okay, yeah, that's the right size. That's fine. And then they start moving the camera 
And they're like, now walk. Now I do this kind of like goofy velociraptor walk <laughs> where I'm like kind of walking the ball. And I know everyone in the crew because I've worked as a PA with all of them. Yeah. And everyone is just laughing at me. Yeah. Like everyone's kind of stopped the set. Look at Eli. Now he's an actor. Now he's a stand-in. And everyone is Slowing rightfully down the so. the production. <laughs> the whole production is making fun of me, yeah. rightfully so, because I look ridiculous. And Martin Bress, the director, walks by and goes, who is that? And they were like, and she goes, boy, sister's AD, Amy. He goes, boy, that, they're like, oh, that's Eli. They're like, I got to tell you, that kid is one untalented stand and fire him. And so Amy Sayers, who I was friendly with, who I had been a PA for at lunch, she's like, she comes over to me and she's laughing. And my friend Chris, who I had helped get him the job because I knew one of the producers, they're like, the director, Martin Brest, just fired you for being an untalented <laughs> like, stand-in. How? They're like, I was like, how can you be an untalented stand It's like, <laughs> he saw you walking. I was like, I was just going to get like boots <laughs> with a heel and wear that tomorrow. And they're like, Martin says, you're too untalented to be on his set. And he doesn't want you there. So That's I was so like, sad. well, I basically turned down every other, like all the other movies were crewed up. Yeah. I was like, well, what do I do? They're like, well, you can come back and work on the movie. We just have to keep you far away from Martin Brest. Uh, so I had to cool. be like in... I remember it was Brad Pitt and Anthony Hopkins walking down the street or the car scene. I had to be like stopping people from, yeah. you know, crossing the street and then turning the air conditioning on and off. Yeah. They were like, air on. you like, cut, air on, air off. I like sat in a room. For, I was like, this You're is the worst. You're regretting your walk. <laughs> it was terrible. Like, like, and then I, I think I, I sold something, got a writing thing. And then the movie was a huge bomb. And then Martin Bress went to make Geely and never made another movie again. So And you're like, karma. Let's see who's untalented. Yeah, exactly. Martin Bress, you're more than welcome to work <laughs> as a stand-in on my movie. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's too and bad. The him. worst part is because Martin <laughs> Bress was one of my favorite directors. I love Martin Bress. I loved Beverly Hills Cop, Going uh-huh. in Style. I love Midnight Run. And I was so excited to like watch Martin Bress direct. That's, then he fired me. That's why you never want to meet like your... Meet idols, your idols usually because then yeah, we were actually talking about that it's like i don't really want to meet you guys thanks yeah <laughs> it's like it's thank hard. gosh you're like Sometimes, you're cool well <laughs> oh thank yeah you. Look, yeah that you know what i was for this morning but um, <laughs> no no I, it's I it's cool you know look there's some people that I knew he was. look there's yeah, some look it can go either way <laughs> sometimes you can meet your heroes and it's hugely disappointing yeah because you've built so much up and yeah. then other times like, my hero in film school was Tarantino. Yeah. And he became, like, my best friend. Which is so, so cool. Which is weird in one way, but also totally natural because you're like, oh, this person understands me. They're making exact... Because when I saw Reservoir Dogs, it was the first mm. time violence had been in movies in, like, 10 years. Yeah. And it was like, oh, someone who knows what I want, someone who loves the movies I want. <laughs> this, you know, I was like, this, this, if I ever met him, we'd have so much to talk about because we like the same movies. Yeah. And he felt that way when he saw... Cabin Fever. He's like, finally, someone that likes horror movies. But and then we met. And we were like, yeah. like totally nerding out. And then it grew into a real friendship. And then you know, bastards together it was one of the greatest, greatest experiences of my life. And how did so you were friends before doing that? We were movie. friends, and he came on and he read Hostel. Yeah. I remember. I, I remember. I had turned down a movie. I had turned down Dukes of Hazard. Oh really? And I felt really weird because I thought the script just wasn't great. And I, I felt like I screwed up because this yeah. was like, I'd only done Cabin Fever yeah. and this was a Warner Brothers movie. Mm-hmm. And I just thought like, shit, I really, this is stupid. Like I'm supposed to do one of those movies to then get in the system to then, but you know, and it was not didn't... a horror movie. And I remember going to Quentin's house and I was like, he's like, what's the matter? I'm like, they offered me more money than I've ever seen in my life. And I was kind of going broke. Yeah. And I, he goes... He goes, well, obviously you said you said no because there's a reason you felt like... I was like, I just didn't know how to make that movie good. Yeah. Someone else might. I just don't. And I go... He goes, well, what ideas do you have? Because you're a writer. You're a creator. You're like... You come up with your own thing. And I go, ugh, I got this one idea, but it's so sick. I don't know if anyone will ever see it. It's so sick. And he's like, what? And I told him the idea for Hostel. And he's like, it's the best idea for a horror movie I've heard in 10 years. You have to do that. I go, well, what if, what if no one sees it because it's just so violent? And he goes... It, who cares? He's like, what, don't think about opening weekend. Think about the weekend 15 years from now if kids are still watching it at a sleepover. Yeah. That's the only weekend that matters. 15 years from now if people are still right. watching it. He's like, Reservoir Dogs made no money. 15 mm-hmm. years later, it's a classic. It's like you don't know if it's going to make money or not. He goes, and if you do it for $3 million, you're not going to get hurt. Someone will make their money back. Yeah. And I, and I told him, and I wrote it. I wrote it in like 10 days. And then I brought it to his house. And, it, and we just like, we went through the whole thing. He's like, this is good, but it could be better. Mm-hmm. And I remember we went out to the Saddle Ranch. He's like, let's go to the Saddle Ranch. So he's like, let's take the pussy wagon. So we get in the pussy wagon and we roll up to the Saddle Ranch. <laughs> the car ranch. that attracts females. 
I'm so, I mean, he pulls up to like (laughs) nice and subtle in this big yellow, you know, the truck from Kill Bill that says pussy wagon on the side. Oh, yeah. Oh, my gosh. He's like legit pussy wagon. It's the pussy wagon from Kill Bill. Yeah. The big yellow one with the red, you know. So we pull up at the Saddle Ranch and I have my script and my notes and we go and we sit down and we're like, and he starts like going through dialogue. Now, this is like Quentin Tarantino, like Mm. my hero who loved my first movie, is giving me script notes. He's like... I think that this guy wouldn't know how to use a gun. We gotta figure out a different way. He's like, anytime I feel like there's movie convenience, I'm gonna call you out on it. I'm gonna call bullshit. He's like, this feels like you're not thinking hard enough. This is movie convenience. Mm-hmm. How would you, we don't know how to fire a gun. How would we get out of this situation? So we're like, and he's giving me, he's like, I've always kind of wanted to use this line. And we're like, we're sitting there kind of rewriting like the dialogue together and talking about the script. Yeah. And girls keep coming over and bothering, oh, Mr. Tarantino, blah, 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 Quentin yeah. Tarantino. And I'm like, at this point, uh, you don't even want the girls. I'm, I don't want the girls around. Yeah. I'm like, I'm like I got Tarantino. So we're drinking like yeah. margaritas or this. And then the girls come over and they were like, and, and I was like, I, I'm almost there. Like he's almost through the notes. Yeah, yeah, come but on. these like, but like three like really attractive girls come over and they're like, yeah. let's hang out. Here's our number. Call us later. So, of course, now his brain, yeah, he's like, before he's married, this is 15 years ago, he's like, yeah. well, what did those girls do? I mean, maybe he's like, he's like, I think we've done it. I'm like, no, no, no. Like, like no. I got him. Yeah. He's focused. He's focused on my script. So He's, he's like, I think we're good for today. He's like, let's go back. to. I'm like, why don't we just go back? He's like, guys, we're, we're going to go work. He's like, let's go back to the house. So we go back to his house. Yeah. And he's like, we got to, we got to, like, work some more. And then he's like, so we're reading through the script. So you script. go back to the house with the girls? No, with me oh. and Quentin. But of course, his brain is like, well, are these girls are going to come back. So yeah. he's finally like, but I've got him focused on the script. And he's like, well, maybe we should see what those girls, maybe those girls want to come out and go to like dinner with us. They said they wanted to go to dinner, right? And I was like, oh, yeah, but wouldn't it be cooler if it's just the two of us? Oh and he's gosh. like, yeah, but we're doing, you know, let's. And so he's like, do you want to hear some of Inglorious Bastards? This is 2004. And he reads, he starts reading me. Inglorious Bastards, acting out the whole Hitler bear juice scene. Oh my God. The scene so that cool. I eventually, five years later, you know, four years later, go to play. Mm-hmm. So we're, I'm sitting there and I'm just like listening to the most amazing dialogue I've ever heard in my life. And he's acting it out. I call it like Quentin Tarantino theater. He's like, nine, nine, yeah. nine, the bear you did it. And he's like, I'm like, wow, your Hitler's amazing. He's like, I yeah. do a good Hitler, right? Like, <laughs> yeah. so, so I'm sitting there and then the girls show up and I was like, damn it. These girls are like, like not only do I have Quentin rewriting the movie with me, He's now reading me from his new secret project he's been working for 10 years. Mm-hmm. And these girls show up and I was like, oh, what are we gonna do? And so, these, so the girls were like, hey, what's going on? Like, and it's just totally not the movie vibe at all. Yeah. They wanna go swimming, they wanna do this. And I was like, let's have a Charleston contest. Yeah, yeah. I'm like trying to think of the most annoying thing I can do so the girls will leave. Oh, oh and my And so I gosh. was like, and Quentin's like, that's a great idea. <laughs> Oh, he loved it. He thought it was the funniest thing ever. Yeah. So we put on the music and like we started, and I was like, here's my Charleston. And I start doing the Charleston. I was like, you know, in the 1920s, that would be like a thing to have a Charleston contest to see who could do it for like three days straight. So nonstop. great. You just set it up for like a three day marathon of the Charleston. Yes. Yes. So we start like, I start like trying to have a Charleston contest. Oh my gosh. So the girls will leave so that I can get back to writing Hostel and listening to Quentin read me and Glorious Bastards. And then Quentin's like, and then the girls are like tired of the Charleston. So the way they get out of the Charleston is they strip off to their underwear and they jump in the pool and they're like swimming around. I was That's like, an easy out. Like, mm. The girls, I was like, they're good. all right, one, they're real good. challenge accepted. <laughs> yeah. So I was like, all right, what are we going to do? And I was like, I'm really you hungry. You take off your pants and you start doing the No, Charleston. I was better. I was, like, off the I was like, I'm so hungry. And Quentin's like, I'm hungry too. Let's get some food. Let's get some food. So he, we wound up going, Quentin's like, the girls want to go somewhere really fancy. And Quentin's like, let's go to this Mexican, this Mexican place on Sunset that's basically a step above Taco Bell. The girls really want to go in the pussy wagon. They're like, we got, because they want to roll up oh, at yeah. some restaurant with Tarantino in the truck. Yep. Now, Quentin had his 1988 Volvo, which was destroyed. It's the car that he would drive around that he didn't care about getting dinged. But it was his car from before Reservoir Dogs. Uh-huh. And he's very superstitious. Yeah. So he likes to have the 88 Volvo because that's like the car that right. he wrote Pulp Fiction in and that would always get tickets and he had to sleep in that car when he yeah. was, didn't have a place to live. Like that blanky. Kind of, exactly. Yeah. So I was like, why don't we take the Volvo? The Volvo's perfect. He's like, let's take the Volvo. The girls yeah. see this 88 Volvo and they're like, 
Disappointed. Very disappointed. They're like, well, we sure we can't try because this is like Kill Bill has been in the theaters three months ago, so it's yeah. like the truck. Everyone knows the truck. Yeah. So this is why we're here, yeah. right? So they go. <laughs> so finally, the girls convinced we go to we we got we get in the truck. It's okay, fine. Uh. So we go to the Mexican restaurant. The girls are just not impressed, and we're just like eating nachos and blah blah blah. And the girls are like, we really wanted. They wanted to go to like some club on Sunset yeah, that would cool hide vibe. or whatever was the hot club at the time. Get photographed maybe. Yes. Yeah. That's what it was all about. And Quentin's mm -hmm. like, I, he's like, I know a much better place we could go. The girl's like, let's go to a club. Let's go to a club. We want to go out. We want to go dance with you guys. And, and Quentin's like, I know a much better place. And they're like, what? He's like, let's go to Plaza. And they're like, what's Plaza? And they're like, you don't know Plaza? Plaza is like one of the best clubs in the city. We walk in, we, we roll up to Plaza. The girls don't know that this is like a full gay trans bar. Oh, really? And Quentin and I walk in. On Santa in. Monica? <laughs> no, it's, it's on La Brea near, uh, near Melrose. I had never been in there. Yeah. Quentin's like, plot, it's a Mexican like trans bar. It's like a theme. It's, you got, and you it's guys fully, got going. And, like, and the girls walk Mexican. in and their faces yeah. are just like, this is not what we signed up for. And everyone's like, Quentin! And Quentin's like, what's up? <laughs> and they're buying us drinks and all the girls, it's like a full gay trans bar. Yeah, and me so and Quentin fun. are being treated like Kings. royalty. They're being so nice to us. Like, welcome back. They're buying, so yeah, they're like for Quentin, they love yeah. Kill Bill, they love the girls, they like, and all, like, everyone is fully done up. Yeah. Like, Latin, drag, full hardcore. And we're having so a fun. great time. And the girls are like, finally, it finally boils over, and they're like, look, we really just want to go. And then, like, he wound up like, taking them to a club like they, yeah. they he gave them so what they, they wanted won. they won the girls uh. won and then but by that point it was like 11 o'clock i was like i'm i'm going home I'm yeah going to sleep. but i wrote the script i mean like eventually you i went and i made it. the movie <laughs> i finished it and shot the film and he came on as executive producer and then we did hostel 2 together and then i did the fake trailer and grindhouse and mm -hmm. then um you know and glorious bastards he he had been writing he's like i have this character this boston jew i've really had you in mind for it. And he saw me, my acting in Cabin Fever and in Death Proof, his film, and he's like, yeah. you could, he's like, you're not pushing yourself. He's like, you really have it. You really could be great. Mm -hmm. And it's like when Quentin says that, of course. Yeah, and then, then, of course, knowing you're going to be on camera with Brad Pitt, there is no motivation like the on camera motivation. If you know you're going to be photographed yeah. in a movie with Brad Pitt, you're like, yeah. <laughs> like I am you know, the bear too. Went, went crazy. <laughs> yeah. And so yeah. I just fully went in it. And then afterwards, I wrote, Man with the Iron Fists with RZA, the martial arts movie that Quentin came on as exec producer. So basically every project we've done, mm -hmm. it's just been for fun where it's like one of us was doing it and it's like, hey, do you want to be part of it? That seems to be kind of how it works. I mean, it's obviously talented people getting together, but then just, it's just, you want to work with your friends. You want exactly. To, that's your life now. Yeah. Like, you know. It's the best. And, and it's great to work with someone who is so much better than you mm -hmm. that believes in your talent. Uh. So that cool. you can really learn from. That mm -hmm. they're like, okay, no, no, this is really good. This is, you're on the, you know, you sort of need someone, like a mentor figure, someone you really respect to kind of kick you in the ass a little bit. Everybody needs it. But you pay it forward too. Like yeah. you, you were blessed to have that happen in your life. But even with me, when I was like to you, I'm working on scripts and stuff. You're like, anytime, just send it my way. I believe that. Yeah. I, I believe, I think it's, look, I, I feel like, I have a lot to offer and you want to offer it to the people that will really mm -hmm. appreciate it or get use out of it. Yeah. I mean, I've found, I've had a great time, you know, mentoring. There were, look, I remember John Watts is this mm -hmm. director who made this short film of a fake trailer of me directing this movie, Clown. Mm -hmm. And I contacted him and said, let's turn this into a real movie. And we did, the, we did it as a real movie. And now he just did the two, Spider-Man Homecoming. He directs the Spider-Man movies. Now he's doing movie with Michael B. Jordan. So he's like, he's, he's a huge director now. And, mm -hmm. and I love John. I just thought he was a great, great guy and so smart. And I, you know, was able to get him a million and a half dollars for his first movie. And that feels really nice. And then there's, I mean, look, when I was, when we wanted to make a sequel to Last Exorcism, we mm -hmm. never quite class, cracked the title Last Exorcism Part 2. I wanted <laughs> to call it Devil Inside, but then that movie took that title. And Damien Chazelle was like a 25-year-old math tutor when he came over to my house and me and the other producer. And we're like, he's really, really smart. And he mm -hmm. had made an indie movie and we're like, he should write it. Now, obviously, he probably should have directed it too. Mm -hmm. But 
at that money, he took that money and he was able to make the short film of Whiplash and then make Whiplash because of that. So, yeah. you know, and then even with Man with the Iron Fist, I spent a year with RZA just helping him, teaching him how to write. And then he puts Dave Bautista in that and then Dave Bautista gets Guardians off that. So there's certain Jeez. people that, yeah. you know, and then Ana de Armas was in Knock Knock. It was mm -hmm. her first English language movie and she's blowing up. And, you know, Lorenza, who, you know, obviously we married, but we did um, three movies together. So it's... It's, it's great. It's like yeah. when you find people that you really believe in their talent and you can help them and nurture that talent and they go on and do great things. It's just a great, I try to be that producer that I wished I had when I was trying to make my first movie in those six years before I got it made. Mm -hmm. You know, when you can give someone their break and they really deserve it, it's like a nice feeling of like, yeah, that person, you know, that's who you want to see succeed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And those are the people that you want to help. And then when they do succeed, you're like, yeah, it's great. It's like good for them. They needed, like, whatever help you can give them, it doesn't really cost you anything. It's not yeah. going to hurt you in some way. Right. Um, and it actually, it feels great. It's like, if it's really anything, nice. sometimes it comes full circle, too. Then it's like it an even does. bigger project that comes up next. So. Yeah, it does. And you always mm -hmm. learn things. Even when you're teaching someone something, you always learn. So mm -hmm. I like it. I like people that are self-generators. I like you because I think you're, you know, you, you take what you have and you're always writing and thinking and creating and thinking 10 steps down and you work really hard. And it's very, mm -hmm. you know, it's when you, all those years I spent as a production assistant and working on sets, like when you find someone that has your work ethic, mm -hmm. you really respect that and that's, that's what you respond to. Because I think everybody now wants the shortcut. Yeah. I'm sure everyone's asked you for the password of like, what's yeah. your password <laughs> to get famous, to get you know, millions of followers, like what is it? Yeah. But the truth is it's finding something and working hard at it every day mm -hmm. and, not, and, and enjoying that process and throwing yourself in it and realizing how good it feels. It's exhausting, but you know, it's, it's the per a lot of people want to, do as little as possible yep. and just want, and then want it instantly. Just having your passion and then just working towards whatever that is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's authentic. Would you say, just to kind of close this out and tie it back in with love, life, relationships, all that oh, stuff. I feel like we didn't even talk about that. Yeah, but you know, I, I feel know. like your love is involved. your, your yeah, work. Yeah, it's true. Yeah, so that's kind of, that's what it is. You can love your work and then just be working the rest of your life. And No, I always tell time. everyone, I was like, any relationship I get into, it's like I'm married to directing. Just yeah. so you know, you have to be okay with that. Yeah, you got to be my like my. You're basically my love affair. Yeah, you're like my <laughs> side piece. And First like, thing is there's directing. people that if that's that communication, if you know that, then you know it's a good relationship, yeah. even as like second best. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So to have a girl that's okay with being a side bitch. Yeah. <laughs> we didn't even go into the honey pot. I was just so interested in all this. I could we could talk for hours and hours, but thank you guys so much for watching oh honey you can check the links below check out all of eli's stuff check out his movies summer's gonna watch inglorious bastards for sure yeah and you know what i think <laughs> finn my shark documentary oh and finn. Oh, finn yes watch finn and actually watch the movies that he uh wrote and directed himself so check them all out it'll all be below if you're on the visual for the youtube video but also for the podcast up. make sure you're downloading our podcast on Apple, was Apple, it Apple Podcasts? Yeah. Spotify, all the iTunes. platforms that I think you it's consume. iTunes too. And make sure you send in your juicy stories with lots of detail to diary at ohoneydiary.com. And we didn't get into the pot today, but no. we will tomorrow. I mean, we will later, so <laughs> send in Next week. your shit. Bye, guys. Love Bye. you. Oh, oh honey. honey. Diary LLC makes no warranty or guarantee as to the accuracy or sufficiency of the information featured in this podcast. The information and recommendations presented in this podcast are general opinions only. This podcast should not be considered professional or expert advice. Reliance on the information provided in this podcast is done at your own discretion. Oh, honey. Oh, honey.